Watch my back. Listen, I'm really bad about putting my thumb into things. I mean, I end up in the jump off of there. Oh, yeah, I know. I've got a winter coat in case I needed it. I've got a blanket in my back. Hello, good evening. I call this regular board meeting of the Forest Hills Board of Education, Wednesday, April the 17th, 2024, to order. Item 1.0, call to order. Mr. Bibb? Here. Dr. Simmons? Here. Mrs. Stewart? Here. Dr. Strickler? Here. Mrs. Jonas? Here. Item 1.3, the Pleasure of Allegiance. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item 1.4, the safety briefing. There is an exit at the top of the steps and at the bottom of the steps. Item 2.1, motion to adopt the agenda. Can I get a motion to either adopt the agenda or amend the agenda? I'll make a motion to adopt the agenda. Second. Dr. Simmons? Yes. Mr. Bibb? Yes. Mrs. Stewart? Yes. Dr. Strickler? Yes. Mrs. Jonas? Yes. Item 3.1, a motion, motion to approve items 3.1 and 3.2 as presented. Can I get a motion? I'll make a motion to approve items 3.1 and 3.4. 3 3.4 as presented, yes. Second. Dr. Strickler? Yes. Mr. Bibb? Yes. Dr. Simmons? Yes. Mrs. Stewart? Yes. Mrs. Jonas? Yes. Sorry, guys, I was looking at the wrong agenda. That's why that was wrong. <laughs> um, special recognitions, Mr. Hook? Yes, we're excited. Uh, every year at this time, we uh, we ask each of our buildings to find one, which is nearly impossible to find a, a volunteer that we want to recognize. Uh, but they have complied, and at least they're going to name one because they're just fantastic. Um, so we're going to start right away with, I believe it's Kyle here come on down and uh, the rest of the principals and their guests can move make their way down the steps and we'll roll through this This is always a very special uh, time of year for a lot of reasons and, and honoring our esteemed volunteers uh, is certainly one of those things that this time of the year we look forward to. Like Mr. Hook said, choosing just one is, is a nearly impossible task, but I wanted to make sure to highlight Allison tonight as a, a volunteer that stands out amongst the pack uh, for a lot of reasons. And, and I'll try to be brief so that, so that we're not here all night because I'm sure every principal feels like they could gush on their, their person. But Allison has stepped up in a wide variety of, of ways. We talked about the academics, arts, and athletics at Anderson. Allison has volunteered in all three of those areas over the last several years. She's been a vice president on our PTO team. <coughs> It's not just because part of her duties is taking care of the treat trolley for the staff every month. Didn't hurt, uh, but uh, that's just one of the many ways that she brings joy to Anderson High School through her selflessness of her time and, and energy and resources. She works tirelessly with our bowling team, which has been having an incredible run over the last couple of years. She even subs. Uh, she responded to the call a few years ago when we were short on subs and we just kind of put that blurb out in our family updates. Allison was one of the few to raise her hand and say, I I'll do that. I will help in a tough time. And that's really what Allison's all about. She does the right thing for the right reasons at the right time. And I'm incredibly thankful that we have her in our organization to make Anderson High School a better place. So thank you, Allison.
While we're Potatoes. transitioning, Allison even came back and helped me with Coin Wars at Sherwood, even though she doesn't have a kid there anymore. So, yeah. <laughs> we'll just kind of go secondary, and then we'll start moving down through the elementaries. And okay. Well, great. Well, it is uh, it's my honor to uh, to talk to you a little bit about Laura Tassoon. Um, once again, uh, just like Kyle said, and everybody's going to say the same thing, you know, there's 20 or 30 or more parents that we could bring here tonight. However, um, I'll tell you about Laura. You know, as far as our um, school store spirit shop, she is the one behind it. She's been behind it for years. Uh, the one that selects what we get in, uh, does the designs. And then not only all that, she's either, typically it's her there, or if not, she has additional parents and she schedules those parents there during our, um, during every time we have, you know, our larger home games, it's open, moves everything outside so people can see it, especially for football games, and moves everything back in, and then does that over and over and over again. And then if that wasn't enough, she thought, you know what? I feel that we're not getting enough students that are coming to this. You know, what if we have a student that wants to buy something and they don't have, they can't get here in the evening to a game? I'll just open it during flux on every Monday. So, and she asked me if that was okay. I said, absolutely, if you want to come every single Monday during the day, and that's exactly what she did. The designs are amazing. I mean, I look really good in almost <laughs> all the gear, and not to mention, we even had to bring in, uh, I'm not the easiest person to fit, and uh, we actually had to bring in some additional material, which I don't want to get into right now, but <laughs> just to fit me. But no, she does an outstanding job, and uh, so happy to have her. Everyone appreciates it, and uh, uh, just could, can't say enough things about uh, about Laura. Awesome. Good evening. Um, as the others have already shared, we're so happy to be able to hear tonight to recognize our volunteers. Um, I'm excited to recognize Jamie Holleran. She serves as our um, VP of concessions on our PTO exec board. Um, as everyone will share tonight, we are so grateful for the parents and the community members that show up to help us in the building with our kids, supporting the events that are taking place. Um, at the middle school, we're even more grateful because sometimes uh, maybe your kids don't want you around all the time. And so we're grateful for those parents that keep leaning in um, to the experiences that we can provide students especially because we know you're coming from your elementary homes, you've built those connections. And so being able to keep leading in and supporting the work that we're doing, we're just really grateful for that. Um, Jamie has an eighth grader right now and a soon to be Nighthawk who will be um, speaking a little bit this evening as well. So um, some of the work that we're, we know that Jamie is really proud of, but we're also really thankful for is um, through her work and getting all of the volunteers to support our concessions. They also have a lot of small businesses like the Ramondo um, Pizza that um, have, they come in and they recognize them and partner with them and all the work that we do um, with the concessions they've raised just over eleven thousand dollars this year um, and so all of that is able to go back to support the work that we're doing um, at Nagel with our PTO so always grateful for Jamie and the work she does um, I know that Zach McCormick our athletic director pointed out um, that while she does the work in getting volunteers she also really really wants to make sure kids are taken care of so when they can stay after school and be involved in the activities that they're also fed um, and they're taken care of so we appreciate everything you do that's awesome Hi everyone, my name is Heather Holly. I'm the principal at Error Elementary. I am here tonight to honor and recognize Carolyn Pettipatty as our Volunteer of the Year recipient. Carolyn's involvement at Error has truly been remarkable. She has always been a supportive member of our school, not only when it comes to her own children, but also for the benefit of our entire school community. These past two years were spent serving as our PTA lead for Global Adventure Day, which is our annual celebration of cultures and traditions around the world. It is truly an unbelievable and unique experience. It also takes so much prep work and planning behind the scenes. Another large task that she has taken on in her current role as PTA treasurer this year, she has really helped support the transition of our Air PTA to an Air PTO. 
Carolyn takes on these huge projects and never complains, at least not out loud. <coughs> when I asked our staff what they appreciated the most about Carolyn's support, comments were shared that Carolyn has always been so positive and eager to help others for years. She has taken on destination imagination teams. She has helped make author visits possible for our entire school. She has been a staple in our VIE program for many years and so much more. The biggest theme from our staff is that Carolyn just loves helping others and we couldn't be more thankful for her ongoing support. I asked one Falcon, Harry, a fifth grader at AIR, what all this volunteer work meant to him as a son who sees his mom do so much for the school. And his response was, I just love that I get to see my mom at school. He also shared his favorite event that his mom has helped with over the years is definitely Global Adventure Day. Carolyn's selfless, generous attitude and approach often show up in many ways that are behind the scenes and without recognition. But the truth is that she should be recognized publicly because she does so much for so many. She should be honored because of her tireless work and making air a better place. It is my pleasure and honor to, recogni to recognize Carolyn Petipati this evening and to show our immense gratitude for your dedication and support of air. Thank you, Carolyn. Good evening, my name is Joy O'Brien. I have the honor of being the Maddox Elementary School principal, and I would like to introduce you to Barbara Purcell. Um, Barb's daughter, Abby, started in kindergarten in 2018, and Barb got excited about volunteering and jumped right in. She's decorated our hallways with artwork, she's held a bookmark design competition for our students, and she's been the Forest Hills Council PTO representative for four years, and served as the VP of Communications for our PTO board. She has also served as our VP of Student Services, so Barb is very, very active and visible in our school. Barb has been a part of making many special memories at Maddox, and even today, Barb showed up to be a hallway monitor for OST bathroom breaks. So that was awesome to see her there. I did ask her daughter, Abby, who is a fifth grader. Hi, Abby. At Maddox, if she wanted to share anything about her mom. So this is a message from Abby. <coughs> and I might cry too. <laughs> I'm happy my mom helps at school because I have more time to be with her. She can also come with me on field trips. In third grade, I went on a trip to the museum and my mom got to help. I'm very proud of her and I think my mom is the most amazing person in the world. Congratulations, Barb. Good evening, I'm Jody Davidson and I'm the principal here at Mercer Elementary School. It is my pleasure to recognize our volunteer of the year, Johanna Good. In 2022, I had this random idea that we would change our outdated preschool playground into a garden as it had to be removed. Johanna sent me an email asking what would the commitment be and what would the volunteers be required to do? Being a humble person, she of course downplayed her knowledge and her willingness to help. Johanna worked with the teachers to create a student-friendly space for all of our children. Students recycled their pumpkins, grew new ones, planted flowers, and learned about the native plants that they are growing. This year alone, Johanna has um, over 180 documented hours during the school day of volunteering. <clears throat> When I asked her son what he loved about his mom volunteering at school, he responded, we get to come to Mercer almost every weekend. When she works in the garden, we play on the playground. <laughs> so that's the undocumented hours. <laughs> the Mercer staff would like to formally thank her for her dedication and passion for the Mercer garden. Thank you, Joanna. Good evening, Board of Education and all of our distinguished guests. I'm Dan Hamilton, the principal at Sherwood, and uh, I, I won't reiterate exactly what they said, but I, I will tell you uh, before I introduce uh, my guest, um, I walked out into our office the other day and talked with my admin assistant, uh, Mary Mitchell, and as I walked out and talked with her, I stopped and I looked, and we had two people, two parent volunteers working on the carnival. We had six more parents who were walking in to help with the walking club, and then we had two more parents who were stuffing 
staff mailboxes with all of this stuff, and I just stopped and said, this just doesn't happen anywhere else, right? We can't do the things we do without these people, so uh, we really do appreciate them. So I am here tonight uh, to introduce uh, Sherwood's Volunteer of the Year, uh, Danielle Quails. Uh, I, uh, I want to first say that Danielle is a um, honored alumni of Anderson High School. Uh, very proud of that. Um, and sh her current role at Sherwood right now, I'm going to start with this, is she is our PTO treasurer. So some of you who know how our PTO is run, that's a pretty big job. And it's a small piece of what she does. So I'm just going to start with that. Uh, other things that she does, she organizes and was the chair of our Back to School Bash, which at the beginning of the year um, helps kick off the school year for all of our students. She's also been a co-chair and has helped with our carnival, which is another massive event uh, that's going to be coming up uh, very shortly. Um, she's also been a part of chairing and co-chairing our picture day and our yearbook. And there's just so many other things that she's done. It's like it's exhausting just to even say those things. Um, she also volunteers weekly, believe it or not, in the classrooms, helping out our, our teachers uh, with copying and other tasks that they have. And I think the most important thing for me is she jumps in whenever <coughs> she can. And so I know when there's an event that comes up, uh, one, of the one of the things that people often say is that um, she's always looking at what is best for kids. So how can we improve and make this event a little bit better? Um, I asked our PTO president uh, to share a few words about uh, Danielle, and this is what Katie said. She said, Danielle is one of the most thoughtful, generous, and community-minded volunteers at Sherwood. Danielle constantly strives, for, uh, strives to help those around her. She continuously considers the needs of the students and the teachers of Sherwood and finds a way to support them. If there's an event at Sherwood, you can often find Danielle there lending a helping hand, and we're so grateful to have her as a part of our Sherwood community, and we're stronger because of it. Like the others, I did ask Silas, her second grader, a few words. Uh, I explained the award, and it was funny. I said, you know, your mom's getting this really cool award, and he was kind of like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I see her every day, it's great. Um, and so I said, what is something that you notice that you just think makes your mom so special, uh, that you notice about her, that you want to share? And the thing that he said to me was, she's just so happy. And to me, that just speaks volumes at, I think, what you know, her own kids see um, and what we see when Danielle is at Sherwood. So, Thank you, Danielle, for all that you do. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Salsted, the principal at Summit Elementary, home of the bees. <laughs> it is a great honor to introduce Katie Dooley as our PTO Volunteer of the Year. Katie has been a PTO volunteer for four years. Um, this year, she is our VP of Communications doing our weekly beeline, which is a huge job. But she also has been our chairperson for Staff Appreciation Week, which I know the staff has really loved all that she has done for that over the years, Eat for Summit, and social media. She helps every year with the yearly PTO audit and has volunteered regularly in classrooms for the last four years. What I really love about working with Katie, um, because she is always just so kind, she always has a smile on her face, and she is so flexible with anything that comes her way. Beyond all of those extra responsibilities, she is also one of our Summit building subs, so she is working several days you know, at Summit besides doing all of these extra duties. Um, Mrs. Dooley was voted as our Volunteer of the Year by our su entire Summit staff, but Mrs. Lucas, her um, daughter's first grade teacher, initially nominated her for the vote. Mrs. Lucas shared, Katie has volunteered as a room parent in our class. She spends countless hours planning engaging activities for the seasonal parties. She's donated books and other learning materials in the classroom, and she often helps prepare materi materials for the students' daily learning. Like some others have shared, I called, um, Katie has three children at Summit, Elijah, who's in fourth grade, Carson is in third grade, and Charlotte, AKA Charlie, who is in first grade. When I called the kids to the office today to kind of talk about this tonight, the first thing I said to them was, you're not in trouble. <laughs> they appreciated that. And then I said, you know, you know about your mom's award tonight. And I asked them how they kind of feel about having their mom as such a strong volunteer at school. They said, we appreciate all of her help. We love seeing her at school. She helps my teacher by helping other students in the classroom. We are really proud of her for getting this award. Katie, thank you so much for all your time and dedication at our school over the past four years, and congratulations on this recognition. Thank you. Good 
Good evening, I'm Erin Storer, the principal at Wilson. It is my pleasure to honor Lauren Hillier for always going above and beyond for our Wilson community. Lauren selflessly dedicates her time to enriching our Wilson community. Whether she is spending endless hours counting pennies through our penny war collection for shop and share or serving on our PTO exec board, Lauren is all in all the time. She truly is all about doing what is best for our Wildcats. It has been a pleasure working with Lauren over the years, and I am grateful for all she does to make Wilson a wonderful place for our students, staff, and families. Lauren, thank you so much. And if we could, Josh, I'm gonna let you. Picture time. Okay, if you guys wanna go out for pictures, that'd be outstanding, and as they're going, Again, congratulations to all our outstanding volunteers. Congratulations, all. And as it was said, as they're, as they're walking out, as it was said, this is the tip of the iceberg. You know, we're just incredibly, incredibly blessed in Forest Hills to have families and, and the support that we get. Um, the tremendous time and dedication, energy that goes into it. You can go into any one of our elementaries, secondaries, and you're going to see the work going on on a daily basis. So thank you to all of our parents, not just our, our ones that were recognized tonight. We just have a great group. So thank yeah, you. Larry, I'd like to add to that. Uh, you know, it's so easy to get caught up. You know, the emails that we get as a board is like people angry about different things that they're not happy that the school district's doing. And, you know, I totally can't stop saying how much we love this school district, how much our son loves this school district. And when you go and you see not just the teachers, but the volunteers helping to put on everyday activities to larger activities like field days, 5Ks, uh, uh, diff just different events, uh, book fairs, all that type of stuff, the volunteers make it happen. So it, it's awesome. You bet. We're, we're really blessed, I'm telling you. It's not that way everywhere. It just isn't. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Item 5.1, Forest Hills Teachers Association. Mr. Preston. Hi there, good evening. Uh, I have two brief updates for you tonight. First, our buildings are in the middle of administering Ohio State tests, known as OSTs, to our students. Our teachers have been working hard all year long to ensure that our students are confident and ready for these state tests. Forest Hills Teachers Association is committed to supporting continued professional development, data-driven decision-making, and collaboration between educators, administrators, and parents in order to sustain positive outcomes. Second, FHTA remains engaged in promoting the professional growth, well-being, and advocacy of our teaching staff within our district. We express our willingness to continue to work with you, the Board of Education, to achieve our shared vision of ensuring success for all students. We look forward to furthering our efforts with you in making a positive impact on the lives of students teachers and the community as a whole thank you thank you thank, thank you. you item 5.2 forest hills foundation for education mrs gilliard good evening um my name is stacy gillard um, like Mrs. Jonas said, and I am thrilled to be here tonight. Um, we are days away, weeks away, I should say, of the Forest Hills 5K, which is on Saturday, May 11th. I have a lot of folks with us here tonight that I know want to share a lot of exciting things that are happening between now and May 11th. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Miss Laura, first and foremost, if you are ready to enjoy nice weather tomorrow, because it's not supposed to rain, um, join us at the 5K pre-party, which is going to be held at Wandering Monsters from 5.30 to 7.30. Um, they are generously giving back 10% of food sales to the kids. Um, and also, we've been promoting this with the over 600 running club students at all the elementaries that we have participating in the race, which has been great. Um, I also want to give a special shout out um, 
when you, I remember three years ago when I came into this role and saw like how big the 5K was um, and know how much it has grown in the last few years, it really takes a team of people. It's not one, it's not two, many times it's many, many people. <laughs> and so I wanted to publicly thank tonight um, Amy Heiss and Lauren Tischler who are the co-chairs of the race this year. They're gonna say a few words in a minute. Sarah Flora and Mona Hale who are in charge of all of our sponsorships. Megan Wolf and Laura Dino, the aft party and pre-party and Jamie Holleran and Stephanie Brown with our volunteers. So I know Jamie was actually just recognized earlier. So I have some fun students here that we're gonna just say a few words and then I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren and Amy. I like the 5K because it brings our community together. One thing I like about the 5K is I get cool snacks and stuff and I like seeing my mom work there. <laughs> oh, and when you support the Forest Hills 5K, you're supporting the students. <laughs> slide so I remember what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how can you get involved? You can register today. Uh, registration is already live. We've got it pouring in. One thing we did change this year, um, as everybody probably knows, costs of everything went up. So one of the ways we're trying to mitigate that is it's just $2 for a t-shirt if you want it, but you can also opt out. Um, if you can't attend, um, you can still do a virtual option. Um, you can still come hang out at the after party, come to the pre-party. Um, and we are always, always looking for volunteers, which if Jamie comes back in, she might, she's in charge of volunteers. Mm -hmm. You get a really cool blue shirt. Um, and the UPS store, our locally owned UPS store, actually sponsored all the volunteers and getting all the things they need. Um, so we hope you sign up for that. You can go to the next one. Awesome. And then um, it takes a whole lot of incredible sponsors to be able to make this event go. One of them um, that we just mentioned was uh, the UPS store, a locally owned UPS store. Uh, Tri-State Running has been incredible. They have done so much. One of the things was uh, sponsoring the run groups this year, and they are also offering 20% off on run gear for students, for parents. If you go in there and you mention the 5K. Go to the next one. <laughs> All right, and then we have solidified our prizes. Our prizes. So um, schools get prizes based on participation percentage. And so for elementary, they're going to get wh whatever whoever's the top elementary participation, they'll get free Kona. Um, the top secondary school will get coupons for a free Gold Star Coney. The staff with the highest percentage point, this is always a really hot ticket item, um, is two free Riverbend tickets, and the. Um, amazing Jersey Mike's uh, donated. They'll give the second place staff all lunch. So these are really great prizes that um, we can't wait to tell who the winners are right now. Um, Air is in the top fundraising position and Laura Denna, who's on our team, is the top individual fundraiser, but there's still lots of time. So it's heating up and we'll see who wins. <coughs> Oh, yep, and here's the, the, the prizes for top fundraiser. Um, so top fundraiser will get four free FCC <coughs> tickets, parking, and free tri-state running shoes. The second top individual fundraiser will get four free Reds tickets, 50 West gift cards, and swag. And again, those were all really nice donated things from wonderful families and sponsors. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. All right, Amy, I think you're done. Okay. So I will be quick. I know that we've talked a lot and you guys have a long meeting. Um, the race could not happen without many people in this room. And I know I'm forgetting people. So if I forget you, please, it was not on purpose. I'm just having a senior moment because after I've turned 54, it's like, kind of a, you know, happens more often than not. Anyway, first of all, I'd like to thank Larry Hook for allowing the race to happen and for participating last year. It was great to see you cross the finish line. Um, we could not do it without our Bob and Rob team. Um, they are amazing. And oh, and there we go. We have a picture. Um, in their <laughs> favorite costumes, like really having you guys, the smiles that you put on the kids' faces and the adults' faces as they cross the line is awesome. So thank you for doing that this year. We really appreciate you guys doing that. Um, John is not here, but John Eckerd, Larry, Dean, and his team, I mean, we could not do it without them. Like they make the race happen with all of the little <laughs> logistics that we ask for them to do, dropping off gators, picking up gators, putting up fences. They are invaluable, and I just wanted to give a shout out to them. Steve Meese, we could not do this without you without Wi-Fi. Like, I'm just telling you, the Wi-Fi last year was incredible, so thank you for all that you do for that. Um, Tiffany Brennan just left, but Nagel, they let us take over their school for two days, and it's just incredible, so I really appreciate all of their help. Um, Brian Stewart, he was here. He's up 
he's up here. He is the, I mean, he's the man that makes this happen. Like I could not do this without him and he's retiring this year. So I just wanted to have a special shout out for him. I really appreciate all of your help. Um, and Josh was on, thank you for all of that you do for publicity. We really appreciate that. But one person I really want to thank most of all is Jody McKinley because she has been like my right hand person from the very beginning. Whenever I have a question, I just pick up the phone and call Jody. She's been with the race from the beginning. So a huge shout out to her. So I know I've forgotten people, but also just thank the district, thank board members. Please come participate, run, walk. Um, this is a great event and really we couldn't do it without you. So thank you very much. Well, please come out and volunteer. You're going to get free donuts, free coffee, and this beautiful shirt. And a beautiful token. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Item 6.1, superintendent update. Mr. Hook. Thank you, Mrs. Jonas and members of the board. Just a, a variety of things. First of all, you know, once spring break happens, it's, it's like a sprint to the finish line. It's... You know, you just, um, we are like deep into the, oops, sorry, deep into the testing season. Um, as was mentioned, uh, the Ohio State tests in English language arts, um, as well as in science, um, deep into those things. Um, we also, uh, at the secondary level, you know, are dealing with the graduation tests in algebra and, and um, biology and government and history so a lot of stuff is happening um, and just when you think it's about over then then i ready takes over uh, we do i ready testing coming up um, right right at the end of april and through about may 10th um, and that's really important because that's what we really look at in terms of driving instruction, helping to understand where our kids really are, a little bit of progress monitoring and those kind of things. Um, and then May, of course, is fun for all the AP students because they get to take their AP tests, which are uh, exciting. I remember being the coordinator of that uh, way back when. and. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit of a stressful time for those guys, but they do great. Um, and that's usually the month, uh, month of May. And then the final sprint, uh, the week of May 20th is the finals at the secondary. And then guess what? We're, we move into graduation. Next thing I want to mention is prom. We're in prom season, not just obviously for us, uh, but we start that right away here, April 20th, just a couple of days. So Turpin High School this Saturday uh, is prom at the 20th Century Theater. And then they go back to the high school for after prom. And then Anderson will be a couple of weeks later, May 4th. That will be at the Cincinnati Museum Center. And then again, back to the high school for after prom. Um, they stay up way later than I can do that. <laughs> so that's, but it's an exciting time and such a memorable time for our kids. Um, so it's exciting as we get into this, just uh, realize you'll start seeing a lot of nice gowns and tuxedos and different things like that. So it's a fun time for these kids and it's a, it's a memory maker for them. Uh, as I mentioned, commencement uh, will be this year, uh, Saturday, May 25th at the CentOS Center, uh, obviously on the campus of Xavier University. Anderson High School this year will be first at 3 p.m., followed by Turpin High School at 6.30 p.m. So that's Anderson at 3, Turpin High School at 6.30. Uh, give yourself a little time. Don't try to hit that place you know, in a whirlwind, because if you've not been to a graduation, it's a, if this is your first child, give yourself plenty of time to get there and navigate traffic, um, because it'll be, it'll be full. Um, so with that, I want to move into some more exciting things, and I'm going to have some of our uh, new administrators and those that 
if you're here, come on down. I'm going to have you stand over here so you can get a smile for the camera. <laughs> Is Nathan there? Come on down, Nathan. I didn't see if Cammy showed it. If Cammy was here, she may be involved in something. So awesome. Well, first I want you know one of them that that's not here is uh, Cammie Eberhardt um, in our, a little bit later in our um, meeting. Um, she'll be brought before you and recommended for the associate principal's position at Turpin High School. That replaces Brian Lee, basically takes over those responsibilities involved with scheduling uh, is one of the most predominant pieces um, that they do. And so we're very excited for Cammie. Uh, to assume this new role and the growth opportunities that gives her as well um, while serving our great students at Turpin High School. Uh, secondly, everybody knows Nathan Dumford. Nathan, step forward there. There we go. Just wave so we know. Okay. Uh, Nathan will be recommending Nathan, who is currently a, an assistant, super, or assistant principal at Turpin, uh, will assume the role vacated by Melissa Buckaloo uh, for the coordinator of secondary special education. And Nathan's, with his experience as a building administrator and of course a special ed background, makes him an ideal candidate for us in that position. So we're excited for, for that uh, and joining us at the central office. There's a, a lot of work to do and we love doing that and we're glad you're there. Uh, also want to just quickly thank Andy Jados. I don't know, Andy May, if he's still here, just, just thank you to him and, and uh, his crew um, at Turpin High School. You know, finding the right people, <laughs> it's, not, it's a lot of times it's easier said than done. It's, it's um, you know, what's, what's on a resume ne doesn't necessarily translate into who, who it is, but they did a meticulous work critical work and uh, we ended up with we believe two great um, people to come in as assistant principals at Turpin High School. The first one I want to introduce is Dr. Ashley Warren. There's Dr. Warren and she's fin finishing up her eighth year as an assistant principal at Sycamore High School. So we're welcome, welcome her down to the east, southeast side, and that's where it's a good place to be. Um, also, I want to introduce JP Casanova. JP is finishing uh, up his first year as the principal at North College Hill High School, uh, but JP also has 15 years of building administrative experience. and. Um, some of it is, was not in this state, um, but I mean, it's, it's an incredible uh, resume and we're excited to have JP here. And the next one I want to introduce is Ollie Moore. And Ollie is, uh, will, his name will be brought forward at the district level for our director of student services. Uh, he's got an extensive administrative experience as a building principal at Colerain Middle School and Princeton Middle School. He's also got experience, central office experience at Princeton City School District. Uh, this, this is gonna be very similar to the position that Kelly Brazo had uh, a couple years ago. Plus, we're gonna, he doesn't know that, we're gonna give him some other things to do too. <laughs> just because we wanna make sure he stays busy. No, I'm just kidding, I'm playing with him. The only thing I had to say about it when the interview was done is he told me he liked the University of, what was the name of that place? Michigan, that's it, that's it. So I, I'm going to have to work on him a little bit, but I, you know. <laughs> and uh, yes, his better half is here as well, by the way, and she can wave. There we go. Uh, we're glad you're here, and we're glad we've got Ali coming to the forest. So thank you very much. I also want to introduce finally uh, Brian Stewart. Many of you know Brian. He's been the head custodian at Nagel. Uh, I, was, I was waiting for you guys to get excited up there. So we're going to let him retire for 
No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna move him forward as an assistant to Larry Corley, predominantly with oversight over our all of our custodians. Uh, as you know, Larry's just swamped, and we need to make sure that we have a couple of guys in there that really get really get it and know what's needed in the maintenance and custodial arenas. And so we're excited uh, for Brian's leadership and and we're very excited that he's agreed to, to stay on for a few more years. So this is some of the new faces and new positions. I just wanted to make sure you all had a chance to see them. So thank you guys, appreciate you being here. You can feel free to head back and if you wish to stay okay but if not thank you everyone and welcome to four stills <laughs> um, the next thing I want to mention uh, in my update I, I certainly want to congratulate uh, and some really exciting news to once again receive uh, national recognition for our award-winning music education programs um, Forest Hills, this isn't the first time that they've won this, and so that's what's really neat. They just keep doing it. Um, and hopefully, I, don't, I hope people don't take that for granted. It's not an easy task, but they've been named uh, Best Community for Music Education by NAM, which is the National Association of Music Merchants Foundation. It's a prestigious honor, and we've been able to earn uh, the past several years um, and it's just a direct recognition of our entire music education program. So that's, that's exciting. Congratulations to our music educators and all of our kids and parents that support um, our programs there. Uh, the award evaluates school districts, as I mentioned, um, for a variety of things. Again, it actually even goes into the classrooms. It's not just about performances. It's also what we, what do we teach our kids? What are we doing, you know, when they enter into the music programs and what, what they're being taught? So it's a pretty inclusive group uh, and, and process. So very excited for our music programs. Um, kind of in the same vein, I also wanted to make mention that we're in the midst of our performance season. So if you've got a child in one of our elementaries or you got a child in junior high or high school or all of them, you better have your calendar set because this is the season where we're going to have a lot of those little concerts and end of the year programs. And that's exciting. And one of them is, is um, at the high school is really important. <clears throat> Um, is our spring musicals and I want to make sure that because it's they're both coming up like not this weekend but the next weekend so April 25th through the 28th um, you've got uh, Anderson High School Theater is uh, performing Alice by Heart it's kind of a musical inspired by Alice in Wonderland uh, Turpin High School Theater has its version of the classical musical, Into the Woods. Um, it features traditional storybook characters and a unique story. So both of them run April 25th through the 28th. And if you've never seen a high school musical, it's worth the time. <laughs> and finally, um, I think this is what we just were notified by the state um, that Aaron Cox, a third grade teacher at Mercer Elementary School, has been selected as a finalist to represent Ohio in the National Review for Presidential Awards of Excellence in Mathematics, Science, and Teaching. Out of the entire state of Ohio, only five teachers were selected for this honor. And this is the only one in Southwest Ohio, actually anywhere south of Columbus, be real close. Uh, Mrs. Cox really stands out uh, in her ability to create meaningful lessons to solve real world problems. 
which truly engage our students in the learning process. Um, she's just a, a fantastic educator and um, we're excited that she's here and teaching with us. Uh, Mrs. Cox has led some wonderful educational initiatives with the Anderson Township Historical Society and Urban Farm. And she's working with our food service and custodial, custodial staff to develop creative ways to improve sustainability and become more environmentally friendly. Both areas have offered many hands-on learning opportunities for students. Um, and in closing, state finalists are reviewed the five from Ohio, as well as other states, are reviewed by a national review panel. And one of those awardees, one of the five, she got a 25% chance, um, will be announced by the Office of the President of the United States. And we know who, I, at least I know who I'm rooting for. And I think you'll all join me in rooting for Mrs. Cox and wish her the best of luck. Absolutely. Thank you. Go, Aaron. Today. Thank you, Mr. Hook. Yep. Item 7.1, procedures for public comment. The board is committed to conducting its meetings in a productive and efficient manner to assure the meeting is completed in a reasonable amount of time while also recognizing the importance of adequate opportunity for public input. In order to conduct an orderly and fair representation of expression, the board will provide a period of 30 minutes for public participation per policy PO 0169.1 at every regular board meeting. Each speaker will have three minute, three minute time limit. If there is more than 10 speakers, individual time will be adjusted. We do not allow yielding of time to others. The board does not discriminate based on the individual content of speech or viewpoint of the speaker. If several people wish to speak on the same topic, the time may be adjusted. Speakers are asked to speak from the podium and address the board. Speakers are asked to start by clearly stating their name and address. The district expects attendees to treat others with respect and courtesy when expressing concerns or criticism about issues or incidents. We have one speaker tonight and it is Mr. Meshek. Kevin Mishak, 8433 Holiday Hills Drive. Um, first of all, congratulations to all the, uh, the administrators and, and all the uh, volunteers who, are, who won. Um, I came here to talk about the facilities plan, the five-year plan that is being worked on by Mr. Eckhart. I'm disappointed that he's not here this evening. Um, I'm a little disappointed still that the assessment uh, funded last fall failed to incorporate our pools. Um, it still is concerned after we've lost Anderson High School pool five years ago. Um, even though a plan was put forth in 2021, we still haven't moved forward on that plan. Um, it's my understanding that the Turpin High School pool, although it was maintained about 20, 25 years ago in terms of the replacement part, I don't find anywhere where there is a plan to replace or repair it. So at some point, I, I would hope that the, the district would begin a planning session. Large scale projects like this are gonna take five to 10 years. Let's, we know that, all right? We've talked about the cost, whether it's $3 million in 2021 or seven to $10 million, it's still a long-term project that needs to be started now, all right? Um, my understanding of the process is the board has to authorize the district to start planning that process, all right? There's no incentive on their side until they're assigned the task to begin that process. I would ask the board respectfully to start that process to look at what are we going to do about the Anderson High School pool? What are we gonna do within the next five to 10 years about the Turpin High School pool? And how is that going to impact our community given the loss of the sunset pool, all right? There is opportunity, I attended the park district last night. They're looking for collaborative efforts. They do have a 23 acre dog park that we all joke about, but it's just, just a holding spot. They don't really have a comprehensive plan for the beach acres, 23 acre park. There's an opportunity for it, all right? That means there must be a cooperative effort 
towards that end. Not just the parks department, the park district, they don't have the money. Not just the schools, right? We have a lot of funding, we have a mechanism in place. We don't have a place to put it, they do. And the township, because we need somebody to kind of cooperate and over that, look over that. Vicki Earhart is the township administrator. She is fantastic at planning this. <clears throat> it is one of her fine points in life, all right? There is funding available from the state on down the line, um, but not if there is no plan in place. That has to start here. Thank you for your time. Have a nice night. Thank you. Item 8.10, Human Resources, Mr. Fellows. Good evening, happy April, whatever it is. And, uh, it's a busy, busy time um, in our school district in a lot of ways. It's definitely busy in HR. Uh, it's hiring season, and we've got quite a few uh, new recommendations for the board's approval this evening. Um, some really great people, and um, kind of go through this uh, um, item by item here, and I will remind the board that this begins the consent agenda. Um, item A there are uh, retirements. We have one for approval this evening. Mimi Clark, uh, 29 years in the district, and um, she's been at Nagel, um, and she's teaching eighth grade social studies right now. Wish her all the best. Um, she made this decision a little bit later, so I think it's kind of like really exciting for her that, to realize that, oh, I actually can retire right now. So mm -hmm. very much gonna miss her, but excited um, for uh, her uh, future retirement plans. Item B, we have a, a number of resignations. One that was recently added as, um, as late as this morning, we received a resignation. So um, it's just kind of that season, so um, we will um, uh, bring forward I'm sure uh, one or two more uh, before the school year's over, but you'll see certified, classified, listed there um, from a resignation standpoint. Item C is our largest uh, portion this evening, and I'll kind of take it in different segments here. The first, um, just want to point out here uh, on the change of salary, I want to acknowledge um, uh, Steve Trailer as well. Steve is uh, transitioning to um, his retirement home. He also, like Brian, retired and then we said no um, and the board approved him to, to come back during that interim period, uh, but he is excited to get down to Tennessee. Steve is and um, he's in a spot right now where um, he is not going to be able to be here as frequently as uh, full-time, so this is just a reduction of his um, contract uh, for the duration of this this contract um, and then mr. hook had mentioned um, oh and I do want to also acknowledge Steve um, and uh, I want to thank uh, Bob and his team for spending some time and, and um, it takes a lot of time and effort to nominate folks for awards and sometimes that process in and of itself uh, is enough in the number of pages to fill out an application to, to, you know, folks are busy and all that stuff. Um, but I will, I will say there was um, a lot of time and attention that was taken in, uh, in Bob's world on nominating for this. But Steve has recently been the recipient of the OAESA Central Office Administrator of the Year for the state of Ohio, and he's gonna be recognized for that in the summer at the OAESA conference in June, is that right? So um, they had a panel, a site visit come down and met with all kinds of different folks, teachers, counselors, uh, administrators, and uh, it was a great opportunity to kind of brag on, on Steve and, and the great work that he has done. Um, so I'm pretty sure they left and they were pretty, pretty much solid that he got it. But, um, but anyways, very excited for him. Um, the other one is uh, just kind of jumping down. We have, uh, we're looking forward to next year. And kind of speaking on, on behalf of our new administrators coming in, you've kind of been introduced to them all. They're bringing 36 years of administrative experience from all over the place. Larry had mentioned that um, not all of JP's, for example, is in the state of Ohio, and that is very true. Um, 
He's from Southern California, and he spent time in the international school system as well. So he was in Thailand and El Salvador, um, and uh, we're excited for him, for Ali, for Ashley, and certainly for Brian uh, remaining with us and, and helping out Larry um, and the 52 custodians and, you know, however many subs we have on a regular basis as well. So there'll be some great support for our facilities and maintenance department. Um, on the certified side, you'll see there are 23 hires recommended for approval this evening. Six of them are returning after kind of a, a higher resign year or they were filling for a leave of absence that resigned. Um, but, but 23 individuals, uh, great people. And again, I kind of want to take a moment just because of the, it's one thing to see all this come down, um, the 23 people is, you know, I should figure the, the amount of hours that are spent in terms of screening, you know, applicants, candidates, resumes, all that stuff. But it is a lot of work that our principals and our directors spend. Um, so hats off to, to Bob and Shane, to Betsy and Melissa and Jamie uh, and Brad Early, um, because we do have a number of intervention specialists on here as well, and certainly all of our principals. Uh, I'd especially like to highlight our elementary principals because you know, this is a, the second or third year that they have really gelled in terms of collaborative hiring efforts. So all six principals are sitting in on almost all of these uh, first round face-to-face -face interviews after the screenings. And it's pretty cool because, you know, if you're Joy and you're at Max, you might not have a position, but you're still vested in the candidates that we're pulling in. And you also don't know when you're going to get a resignation. Um, so that gives them a chance to all be on the same page, which is pretty cool. Um, so uh, with that, we've got about four more or so as of right now certified positions that we're looking to fill before the end of the year. And of course, if there are any resignations, um, you know, between now and then. And, uh, and on the classified side, we have a, quite, quite a handful that we're trying to fill up as well um, that hopefully next month we will have uh, a number to bring, bring forward. Okay, that was a lot. Um, we've got, we're, kind of weaning down on the end of the school year. So there's only 10 there in terms of the uh, supplemental positions here, closing out the school year, and, um, and only seven subs that we're bringing in at this point. Um, it's, we're almost in that part where the hay's in the barn and you know we're closing, closing things down a bit. But we are thankful for 41 new volunteers that are approved here and, um, and all the work that they do. You know, um, I think our principals say it all. Um, in that sense, so we're very thankful for, for that um, and for their time and effort. Last uh, thing I would point out, items E and G. E, we've got a number of revised job descriptions um, in here. Most of it is alignment issues with, within our um, uh, operations side of things, biz ops and facilities maintenance, food service, transportation. You see the supervisor position there for Brian, that job description kind of resurrected from one that we've used in the past. And, um, and then the workforce development specialist has been revised as well um, in alignment with um, Governor DeWine and the State Board of Education's initiatives. Um, we're excited for, um, to recommend that Melanie move into uh, more of a full-time position doing that great critical work, um, getting our kids as much of an edge as they possibly can. And the last one is uh, just a, uh, an MOU, an agreement, really trying to work with NKU, bring in student teachers, and uh, so it's pretty, pretty standard there. Questions? Sorry, that was, that was a lot. The only FTE increase is Brian's job, right? Brian's is an administrative FTE yep. increase. We okay. do have three uh, certified side okay. that are increases. Um, one is preschool and two are ESC classrooms, um, and those are the two. We have four rooms here at Mercer. We're expanding those to have two at Wilson next year, and that is to keep our numbers down in those rooms with medically fragile or students with a number of uh, intense needs. Rob, those assistant principals and administrators that we're bringing on all had two-year contracts. Is that pretty standard? Standard, mm -hmm. okay. yeah. yeah. And then with the resignations, I noticed there were five Camp Kern teacher resignations, and Camp Kern's coming right around. Like, is the is that unusual that there's five people resigning right before Camp Kern trips? Yeah, no, that's it's not uh, unusual. It is something that we are going to try to do a better job of on a paper trail standpoint, mm -hmm. is making sure that we've got those documented before the end of the school year. Okay. So. Cool. Did you say the hay is in the barn? Was that not the right phrase? 
Yeah. Nah, that's an Iowa thing. I got you. It's all right. I, I, got I, it. I picked right up on it, too. <laughs> it's good. Just thought I'd end it on a light note for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Item 9.0, business operations. Larry's going to step yes, in for I'm, John. Yes, um, again, uh, give my regards. Uh, John is, John Eckert is in Columbus at the OS. BA, he's actually doing a presentation up there. Uh, so anyway, very short, really um, all we're doing here is an intent, a resolution, or it's an intent uh, to award the contract to the lowest responsible bidder, which is Beck Studios uh, for the auditorium stage lighting renovation at Turpin High School. So we just, um, the resolution is similar to others that, uh, we've approved in the past, um, which are basically granting uh, permission to fully execute it. You know, once again, we get a legal eyes on it when it's the final piece is here. But we we need to get this one going because this one is is a pretty big deal um, for Turpin. So, and that's really it. All right. Thank you. Ten point oh teaching and learning. Shane. Okay, a couple of quick ones. Um, the first is another overnight field trip request. This is for uh, the Educators Rising National um, Competition. We sent a good handful of students, probably close to about 80 students to the state competition. Out of that, we have uh, 12 students moving on to national. So request is the approval for these students to go to Washington DC um, for the national conference. Um, if there are no questions, ask that to be approved as part of the board agenda, consent agenda. And then the second piece is the uh, request for approval for a foreign exchange student at Turpin. So this will be the second student that we're looking at um, adding as a foreign exchange student at Turpin. And again, uh, student becomes highly recommended um, from the, the host family as well as the uh, exchange program. Um, as it's noted in the, uh, in the agenda, um, have to go through certain steps, get approval. Um, it's not just a, a quick request. There's a lot of paperwork that's involved, but uh, the corporations and the family have gone through all that. So again, if there are no questions, again, ask that this be approved as part of the consent agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Walking through an obstacle course over there. Um, tonight I'm bringing you the first draft of our health course of study. Um, before sharing, I know Shane a couple of meetings ago had shared um, the process that we go through for a course of study. And essentially a course of study is simply a list of the courses that we offer, the standards covered and in those courses, or the standards covered in those courses um, and the curricular resources needed for the instruction. Um, each content area reviews its course of study on a regular and rotating basis. Um, we typically do it Essentially, every five years we, we try to review, but it's try, it, we try to align it with when there are updates um, with the standards at the state level. Um, for health course of study, we have not actually participated in one since 2009, so we're past due. Um, part of that is because in the state of Ohio, there are not state standards around health education. We follow Ohio Revised Code 3313. Um, and so we do refer to that within our document as well as updates to laws around the SAVE Act and around um, Aaron's Law. Those are different house bills that support instruction around suicide prevention um, and violence prevention for students. And so those have been updated within there. Um, a course of study is, again, like I said, it's usually based on state standards. We don't have those. And so in the absence of those, um, we have used Ohio Revised Code. And we've also developed, as a team, a philosophy um, with the team that's part of the course of study, which is made up of teachers, administrators, and that group of people also um, reach out to leaders from Hamilton County, instructional leaders from other schools, and representatives from um, the Department of Education and Workforce Development. So at this point, what we're sharing with you is just the broad overview. We are sharing that this evening with the intent of having a month for us to have that course of study in our office, so it's there um, in the curriculum department for review by parents and the board itself. 
Um, and then our hope is to have that approved at the May Board of Education meeting. Um, once, while we've had a group of teachers together that have been working on development of this course of study, they've also started a draft of curriculum maps that would align. They are very much skeletons though, because essentially for us to really develop those, we need this course of study um, approved so that we are able to develop something that is aligned to that. So it is there for your review. Do you have any questions? I have a couple questions. Um, I was looking at the terminology uh, for alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, and I know vaping is becoming more of an issue, and I was wondering if we could get that term added directly into that, just because uh, yeah. I think some of the terminology seems just a little dated with some of the new. Yeah, we could do that, and I, I know that, that our intent is to include vaping. I um, figured, I just, yeah. like it's specifically explicit. listed. We just actually just did that in policy. Oh. Yeah. We just revised that because it just it just yeah. seems relevant. Yeah. Well, since two thousand nine, yeah. some some things have happened in the world some in things the have area changed, of yeah. health that um, that's why it's really time for us to update me. the things that are relevant. Um, I also had one other question in regards to um, middle school. <clears throat> going back to it. Hold on. Seventh and eighth grade are lumped into one category. Um, are we talking to the students about this in both seventh and eighth grade, or are we just doing this? We are by law required every year in seventh and eighth grade to have specific discussions. Um, they're not necessarily the same requirements, but I know for every year starting in seventh grade, we have to have um, discussions around suicide prevention, and we have to have, so there are topics that have to be repeated, but others do not. I think I was I was looking specifically at um, standard three mm -hmm. and that seemed um, more like a ninth grade level um, topic instead of seventh and eighth grade and so I was just kind of wondering um, exactly what that looked like and did it actually repeat itself twice. Can you so tell me? It was uh, human body growth and development. Mm -hmm. We are required to teach it both years. Both years and the, the same topics? Okay, that's what I was wondering if it was one grade or the other or. Okay. Any other questions? No, Kim, I have some other comments that I want to make during board discussion about it to have a more robust discussion with the board, but I definitely want to make sure I thank you for the insight into the process of how a curriculum like this gets developed and the, the collaborative effort among district staff, health professionals and whatnot. That's important context to know, thank you. We have a large group of very dedicated professionals that um, are doing their best for our kids. For sure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, item 11.1, .1, technology, Mr. Meese. Good evening. We have one item for technology tonight. That's item 11.1. .1. We're asking for approval for the purchase, the approval of bids for the purchase of equipment and services using the federal E-rate program. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was easy. Well, that was <laughs> <laughs> Or so Atlanta, beat that. their Wi-Fi. <laughs> the Wi-Fi's working, and that's what we want. Twelve point oh treasures update. <laughs> this if you can be um, shorter than Steve. <laughs> I don't know if I could be that short, but this is pretty short tonight. <laughs> May is the five-year forecast, so I have to be short tonight to make up for May. Anyhow, the first item on the treasurer's agenda tonight, uh, 12.1, um, is a request to add a new district provider as part of our uh, district's 43B plan. Um, IPX Retirement has met all the requirements. They've submitted all the pa uh, required paperwork. They have eight accounts, which is what we require to be added as a provider under our 403B plan. So they have met all those requirements. Uh, so I'm respectfully requesting tonight that you um, add them as, uh, as a provider under our 403B plan. Again, that's IPX retirement as part of the consent agenda coming up. 
The next agenda item, 12.2, uh, the treasurer's report. As always, we have three full slides of donations. So over the past month, we received over 24,000 in donations, which brings our total donations over this past fiscal year, which is three quarters finished at the end of March, to uh, 321,000. So quite a bit of money. Not only do we have people giving us their, of their time, as you saw earlier, they're also very generous with their financial resources. Um, item B gives you the snapshot of our November five-year forecast, and we'll be updating that very soon with our May forecast. Item C presents the general fund, our five-year forecast revenues, um, and it compares the estimate on the five-year forecast to year-to-date actuals. So as you can see on this, the largest portion by far of our revenues come directly from local services or local funds. So as you see there, 75% come directly from our community um, and 89% of that is pretty much residential in terms of property owners. Moving on um, to item D. This shows our uh, general fund, our five-year forecast expenditures, and it compares the estimate from the forecast to year-to-date actuals. And you hear <laughs> me say this every month, you can almost divide total annual expenditures by 12. So with 75% of our fiscal year completed at the end of March, we spent 73%. So spending is tracking exactly where we would expect at this point. Item um, presents the activity of the um, general fund cash balance. The balance at the beginning of the year was 20.8 million. And after adding our revenues received and deducting the expenditures year to date, our cash balance stands at 30.1 million, or to put enough, another way, enough cash to operate the district for 114 days. Of course, we do have some encumbrances outstanding against that for um, future goods and services that we've committed to. And once you take into account those encumbrances, our unencumbered balance was uh, 24.4 million, which leaves 93 days of unreserved cash in order to operate the district. So just to clarify, basically three months worth of cash to operate basically. the district, but July 1st is the start of the new fiscal year. So yes. lining those up. Yes. Okay. So moving on um, to item F. This is our permanent improvement fund. This only presents the uh, call center um, 000, um, which is the permanent improvement call center that gets the tax funds. So there are two slides pertaining to the permanent improvement fund, that special call center. The first one um, shows the revenue and expenditure activity uh, for our fiscal year to date and at March 31st. And the second slide um, shows the summer projects that are coming up. And as you can see right now, we have all those summer projects budgeted. We have some out outstanding encumbrances uh, for the uh, Turpin Lighting Program. But after tonight, and of course with the contracts presented in business operations and Steve's uh, short, um, very short but very expensive uh, presentation, we'll have some more encumbrances in this next month. Moving on to item G, that's the investment income snapshot. It gives you some history. And um, as you can see, we've received almost 1.8 million to date in our permanent improvement fund interest. Item H is the March 31st reconciliation of cash balances and investments. Moving on to um, item I, that is our permanent appropriations, and we have two changes. The first, um, the first slide on permanent appropriations shows the totals with the changes included, and the second slide shows you the changes that we are asking for you to approve tonight. So we had some resource, a little bit additional, additional allocation given to us in 
uh, data communications, and in 499, um, we received a 31,000 safety grant. Uh, that grant will go mainly towards uh, PD for our uh, safety coordinator, which of course is John, and also our SROs. And then there will be quite a bit spent on replacing uh, electronic door latches, cameras, things like that. So that's what that grant will be spent on. Also, in addition to these reports, you have on board docs, you have uh, the monthly cash position report that just shows the detail um, by fund special call center um, year to date, month to date. So that said, um, any questions on the treasurer's report this evening? If none, I respectfully that request that you approve the treasurer's items 12.1 and 12.2 as part of the consent action items which began with item 8.1. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? I make a motion to approve 8.1 to 12.2 as presented. Second. Mr. Bibb? Yes. Dr. Simmons? Yes. Mrs. Stewart? Yes. Dr. Strickler? Yes. Mrs. Jonas? Yes. Item 13.0, committee reports. The first one is the policy committee report. We met on, when was it? Mar or, uh, March 27th, I believe. Yeah. Um, I'm the chair of the committee, Bob's the sub-chair. Um, we met the new Neola rep and he shared with us uh, the process for the policy committee. And um, basically it's just these changes are based on any legal alerts or house bills or anything like that. This is a, a volume 42 number two for the January 2024 updates. There's a list of policies there. You can click on them and read them. It was basically just word changes. It, it wasn't a lot of information. Um, really, it's based on the House Bill 33 operations budget and changes to um, the tobacco laws and vaping. So this is up for a first reading and the next meeting, it will be up for the second reading for approval. And then the next committee is teaching and learning. Oh, that's me. Uh, we also met March 27th, I believe, and I am the chair and Wendy's co-chair of the teaching and learning. And we uh, spent most of our time discuss discussing the uh, health curriculum that we were looking at approving today. We also talked a little bit about special special education and um, making sure we're in compliance and the growing number of students with needs in our district. Um, we also talked about, um, should have brought notes, I don't think about it. Uh, our partnership that we are doing um, with like job shadowing and students um, working within the community, um, looking at different jobs. Uh, as my major said, like trades, <laughs> internships, those kind of things. And I think that program is really growing. There was also um, like an auditorium, um, I think, that the, the students participated in. Yeah, the, court, uh, the courts came in with three yeah. judges. Yeah. I was yes. like, I can't remember. <laughs> it <was>. Yes. <laughs> it's been too long. Um, and so uh, I believe there's also some schools that we are going to be getting rid of. Half day kindergarten at, they'll be merging or offering only all day kindergarten at some of the schools. I think that's. And pre-K presented as well. Brad, Brad that, that, was the, that was the point at which I had to leave. We'd been there an hour and 40 minutes and I had a daughter <laughs> standing like, in a car pickup a line. I know. Yeah, so we yeah. we yeah. still yeah. have the ability for some of those to, to still have the, the half day kindergartners, but we may be at a, a different, different location, location just yeah. because we're there, getting out some of space. Those were, <laughs> Or relatively small. In one area. Um, so. I do remember calling everybody for updates on that, so <coughs> and I had better notes at that point. Uh, but I think that was the general gist of what we discussed that day. So. 
Do you have anything else to add? Or um, no, I mean we definitely had conversation about Melanie Hartung's program and the work she's yeah. done around building the the work experience, the awesome opportunity with the judges. She's also offered interview and resume building activities. So really looking at how do we build work experience and maybe start to look at how to build it into the school day as well as just after school options. So that was a, a big part of the conversation, that special really education exciting. and pre-K, as was mentioned. Um, I think part of the conversation with pre-K was understanding some of the um, um, federal and state rules around the requirements that we have as a public school district to make sure we're providing um, services and opportunities for all of the students who have um, special needs or an IEP coming in um, and that our classrooms are um, filling up at this point and we need to make sure that we're uh, making sure we have the resources to provide what's what's required by law so that was a part of the discussion and then there was a large health discussion in terms of where we go, especially around um, elementary, looking at the um, conversations around puberty and when those happen and the importance of providing kids with information as their bodies are starting to change and make sure they know what's what's happening and why. And we, we talked about providing parents with um, information in fourth grade so they would have the entire summer and and resources and to talk to their children about that as well with the discussion being had in the fall of fifth grade. So. Yeah. All right. Um, 14.1, board discussion. I know you want to talk about health. Does anybody want to talk about anything? Okay. Yeah, I have a few things. Um, my list has gotten a little messy throughout, so forgive me while I look down at my notes. Um, a couple different notes. I wanted to um, update the, the board as well as everyone else. Um, as Larry talked about last time, we are very much working within the district on a long-term pool solution and this summer are already looking at renovations and some redesign to make sure that the um, Turpin pool will be able to um, be sustained as a Forest Hill School District pool and will be designed as such. That said, I absolutely do think it is incumbent upon us as a board, and I've talked to all of you about this, to make sure we're asking questions and looking at all of the different options that present themselves out there. So um, I have been in touch with several trustees, several park board members, as well as the administrators um, at both the, the park and um, the township to just kind of gather information and understand where we are and, and look at what possibilities there might be for a collaboration. Um, as And attended the, the park board meeting last night as, as part of that. Um, basically, I've read all of the Economic Development Committee notes from 2020, and those who were involved that included the district, the parks, the um, township, basically reached two barriers in 2020. Um, one, was there a community need? And two, there wasn't land. And so I've been continuing to pursue these conversations from the standpoint of Coney Island just closed their pool and the parks just bought 23 acres of Beach Acres property. So it feels like it might be a good time to revisit this conversation about a possibility for collaboration. And I have had only positive conversations with everybody I've talked to about a desire to come together and collaborate and see about this possibility. Everyone is generally in agreement that the first step needs to be a community survey to ask what the community would like to see happen with that land, which absolutely makes sense to me. Um, so last night at the park board, they discussed um, early conversations, two things uh, of note here. One, um, reaching out to the district um, and to the trustees to look at pulling together a small group to begin some of those more in-depth conversations around the table together, which I think is awesome, um, just to see what possibilities might be. and. And uh, two, to look at a community survey and when that might happen. Um, and the way I, I spoke last night and the way the conversation has kind of been left is the district would be very interested in engaging in those conversations to find out if there's a um, valuable place for us that would benefit our kids and community as a whole. Um, a lot of that probably depends on what the community decides they would like to see happen with that land and whether there is a, a position within that for the school district. So I just wanted to bring up everybody up to speed and make sure everyone was still on board with um, kind of where that's going. And it really is just at a place of asking questions, continuing to come together around the table and, and look at possibilities. So is it the parks doing a survey or us? I know, did, I think we got, I the, think I got one in my email about a park so survey. So they are doing several mini surveys right now as well. That came out at the, the board meeting last night. They've got a dog park survey going. I think they've got a pickleball survey going based on other things they're doing from the um, levy 
that just passed for them. The, it was, I'm not gonna remember all their P's, but right, it was the P levy for parks, pathways, potties, pickleball, and some other things. So they've been doing some mini surveys around those pieces. This would be a much bigger undertaking to try to get a much larger swath of the community responding to really look at what is the long-term vision. The last survey that was done, I wanna say was 2014. Yes, okay, Kevin's nodding, he was there too. Uh, it was 2014, and at that time there was a grand vision for a big recplex complex. Um, I think amongst the park, there was still kind of a hope and desire that that would be part of that. At that point, there wasn't really a pool as part of the equation, but again, I think the context has changed. So there's conversation about having a much larger new survey probably guided by the parks board as a park survey, but also in collaboration with the district and trustees in terms of how that would look and the types of questions that would be asked. And then the information we get back from the community would probably help guide <laughs> next steps in terms of who it makes sense to have involved. So. Yeah, I think related to that, uh, State Rep Rachel Baker came to that meeting as well and talked about the process for applying for state funding and emphasize that a collaborative community effort that involved the parks district, the schools, the trustees, the chamber of Com commerce and whatnot weighs more heavily on the committees deciding who gets funding for a project like that to help offset some of the burden on, on us as taxpayers for a massive undertaking like that. Yes, which would be amazing. I mean, it definitely sounded, just to be very transparent, that the projects that are funded are community supported are collaborative in nature mm -hmm. and have a path for moving forward so that the state money is going to help tip actually getting it completed and they're not risking a, a potentially incomplete project. So um, I think there's great potential. I'm very Pollyanna about this, but I'm excited to, to pursue what the options might be moving forward. And I think we're in a different place than we were in 2020, so. Um. Is that something we can do with the parks is get a, a joint survey together? Or with the at the township as well. Or? Yeah, I just received an email about three hours ago. Oh, okay. Um, I meant to tell them first there was an email. Together. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, about <clears throat> from Ken Kirshner and mm -hmm. and um, so yes, we're in the process of getting something together at least to start those conversations. <laughs> Awesome. Um, second on my list, I would just like to request as a board, I know we had talked about this, I think Jason mentioned it once before, coming together around a board planning meeting. I know we're in a crazy point in the year with um, testing and graduation, but looking maybe at some May or June dates that the, the five of us would be able to come together, really just around a planning session. Um, I think we are, we're doing a great job coming together around the management pieces of coming here and you know being prepared for the meetings and uh, working together around these pieces. But I do think in terms of kind of longer picture vision, um, starting to think about what needs to happen around a long-term facilities plan, um, kind of our vision and direction that we are then able to bring back for Larry and Alana in terms of, you know, where is the district heading? What do we need from a resource perspective, a facilities perspective, a teaching and learning perspective, whatever it might be. Um, I think there are pieces that it's incumbent upon us as leaders to start thinking about what community input do we want around those. But I feel like until we have a chance to to kind of talk and get our bearings together. Um, we don't have time outside of this this forum to move forward with that. So I would respectfully request that we could look at some dates for May, June. And I don't know if that's requesting that Larry send us some possible dates we might be able to get together or how exactly that works. But um, I know that's a conversation we've had. I, I would say June. It's the school year's just slammed, I know, for everybody, but um, booked every weekend in May. Yeah. Okay. So if we looked at something in June, mm -hmm. and then I'm deferring to, to you all in terms of setting that up just because I'm not supposed to email everybody. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. That would be great. Um, I just wanted to give one more shout out to um, the volunteers here tonight. I think that was phenomenal. I was actually thinking in my head, my daughter is playing a game at 10 years old called Try Not to Laugh, where you, with a friend, try to make each other laugh. And I was thinking this felt like Try Not to Cry because the comments from the, the kids were, were just very, very sweet. So that was awesome. Uh, reminder about the fire, Forest Hills 5K pre-party, because it's tomorrow at Wandering Monsters, 5.30 to 7.30, free bowling for running club kids, right? I'm not making that up. Okay, um, so don't forget about that. And then a um, couple shout outs. 
the theater productions, Larry mentioned them, both AHS, Alice by Heart, THS Into the Woods on April 25th through 28th. Um, AHS has a lot of things going on. Um, the PTOs and PTDAs have been reaching out to help familiarize with parents getting used to Anderson High School. The AHS baseball team went and helped at the AIR Festival a couple of weeks ago, which is awesome because they got the high school kids in there helping to fill volunteer spots and be with the elementary kids who will one day rise up to Anderson High School. Um, the, as Larry, um, you know, commended the, the music earlier, both AHS bands this year got superior ratings at the OMEA um, recent competition, and I think this may be the both, first time that both bands have gotten a superior rating, so that was exciting news. And AIR has a big shout out to their PTO, which is in the process of transitioning, PTA, which is in the process of transitioning over to a PTO, which is a big organizational process, but actually brings all of the um, elementaries into PTO status, so there's more continuity between them, and that's been a, a big project that involved a lot of volunteer work, so a shout out to those AIR volunteers who've been involved in that. And those are all my notes, thanks. Who told you to plug the bands? Sorry. <laughs> hey, I just want to point out that came from Kyle as well, but okay. <laughs> um, no, before, I might be biased. Before I start, I, Wendy, I just want to say thank you for your time meeting with all the folks and getting caught up to date on what was happening with the pool. I know those meetings take a ton of time. We don't get paid for those meetings. Uh, um, so I really appreciate that update. Yeah, thank you. Do, on, do you guys have anything to add before we talk about the health course? No. It, real quick, no, just so just we don't get lost. Um, I wanted to make a request for admin. When After you guys have committee meetings, is there any way to get the slide deck to all of us oh. instead of just sure. the two that are chair and sub-chair? And then mm -hmm. the other request from like board member, when we have a committee meeting, would you guys be okay, like maybe the chair and the sub-chair splitting it up? to call the other three so we know mm -hmm. what's going on or okay i just yeah. called everyone no after that's fine meeting. yeah it's just so we're all kind of on the same page um and and we're going to have our meeting when is it may 22nd is it yeah 22nd right yeah okay. 22nd um but before that um camp kern will all the kids fifth graders will have gone to camp kern so um we haven't really heard much about that bob i mean everything's good to go Okay, good. <laughs> Wish everybody a fun time for Camp Kern. Yeah, Bob's like, yeah, we're ready. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't get to that. Oh, that's good. We're rolling. We're rolling. Awesome. Fingers. You said the slide deck. We just, we still haven't seen the um, the slides from the um, uh, speaker at the last uh, uh, Nagel meeting. Oh. Bill, did I, get, yeah. I got it because I reached out and asked for it. I can pass it on. Am I allowed to do that? Who's this website? I can for it. There was like a PowerPoint presentation, everything he had. We were all supposed to get yeah. that. I haven't seen it. Thank you. Sorry. No time. All right. All right. So yeah, I had mentioned that I wanted to talk a little bit about the health curriculum, particularly the human development and growth of the body sections. Um, I just want to preface this by saying that I, I recognize this is a polarizing topic in our community and even among our board. Um, and so I think this is our first big test of a board to have a conversation about something where we might stand on different sides of the fence on and have a civil conversation to see if we can come to some agreement on something. Um, I think what I'd like to do for the next 45 to 50 minutes is talk to you all about like five to seven minutes. But that doesn't sound as bad when you initially- I just want to get out of the- I hope that's not true. <laughs> that's a joke, that's a joke. Okay, so, so as uh, Kim was mentioning earlier, the state law help, uh, guides us on what we teach um, related to sex education. Um, Ohio Revised Code Section 3313.6011 specifically. And when I read this revised code, it seems very outdated, in some ways draconian, in ways that are meant to shame students out of having sex at the expense of providing medically accurate information about sex, sexuality, relationships, consent, and human development. Um, specifically in the revised code, there's things in there that say, um, in terms of what schools are required to teach regarding sex, sex education, is that stressing that students should abstain from sexual activity until after marriage, uh, teaching the potential physical, psychological, emotional, and social side effects of participating in sexual activity outside of marriage, teaching that conceiving children out of wedlock is likely to have harmful consequences, emphasize adoption as an option for unintended pregnancies, 
of course, no mention of abortion, which was just um, passed as a constitutional amendment in Ohio in November. And we see the influence of this Ohio law in our uh, health curriculum as it relates to the human growth and development where the sex education conversation is ha housed. So my comments here tonight are not meant as a criticism of the, the team that put the health curriculum together. I, I think it's really in depth. I think it's awesome. And I'm by no means a sex ed curriculum expert, but I do have a lot of familiarity with creating and assessing student learning outcomes. And when I look at the health curriculum, particularly as it relates to um, the growth and development section where the sex ed is, is discussed, you know, some of these learning outcomes, like at the middle school level, it says students will demonstrate the ability to use interpersonal communication skills to promote an age-appropriate choice related to being abstinent until marriage, um, use decision-making skills in relationship to puberty, human sexuality. And what they actually get in there are content related to re reproductive body parts, managing difficult relationships, individual rights to refuse sex. Um, I know Kim mentioned that the curriculum is kind of in a skeleton form, but don't really have anything specific about asking for consent um, and receiving consent, um, demonstrating consent. It also includes responsibilities of parenthood, STIs, benefits of abstinence, and then sexual risk behaviors. At the high school level, there's a big emphasis on teaching students how to get information um, outside of the schools about sex education, which, which is great. Um, but also it explicitly says in our health curriculum that we are to explain that most students are not sexually active, which I have some data that I'll talk about in a second that that is actually false, uh, as well as plan strategies for avoiding situations that place one at risk for engaging sexual behavior. So when I read these, like these are not learning outcomes. I read them and they come off to me as scare tactics, shaming, some information literacy, sex avoidance, and misinformation brought about by abstinence-only education. And if we look at, if we compare these sections of the health curriculum to the healthy eating portion of the curriculum, drug, alcohol, and tobacco education, we compare those to what's included as part of sex education, the sex education part is much, much less. The other ones are much more in depth, much more, much more uh, uh, robust. So what's the big difference? Well, those other ones, healthy eating, drug, alcohol, tobacco, they're not driven by religion and politics, but rather best practices guided by the scientific community. We want our kids to be financially literate. And we teach them drug and alcohol literacy and information literacy, literacy. So why not a medically accurate sexual literacy program that parents can choose whether they want their children to participate? Uh, I was talking to Kim earlier today. She said that we actually have very few opt-outs as it is related to the human development portion of our curriculum at the elementary, middle school, and high school levels. The parents trust the teachers and the districts with this information, but much of the information they get is guided by Ohio law, is outdated and inaccurate, stigmatizes sex, only presenting it as a negative, presumes heterosexuality, uh, stigmatizes the experience for children that were born out of wedlock, and leaves kids uninformed and have to search for information themselves. We lean into, I mentioned, we lean into that piece about asking them or teaching them how to find information, who to talk to, but that information hasn't been vetted and students don't know what they don't know. They don't know the right questions to ask or how to ask them. We can provide resources both in the classroom and outside of the classroom to help answer difficult questions, but we get to vet what those answers are instead of them stumbling across something they might find through a Google, shirt, uh, Google search. I strongly believe that we underestimate kids' capacity to learn and talk about uncomfortable topics and engage in course materials, and we overestimate at times parents' preparedness and ability and willingness to have these conversations. So there is a provision in that Ohio revised code that allows for additional sex education. Um, and, and it reads, I'll, I'll paraphrase, but a school district can choose to offer additional instruction in venereal disease or sex education, not specified, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, the school shall notify all parents or guardians of that instruction, including name of the curriculum, all this stuff. And then uh, no district or school shall offer that instruction to a student unless that student's parent or guardian has submit and ri submitted written permission for that student to receive that instruction. And this really excites me because I'm confident that one thing that all five of us can agree on is that we share a common ground on parents being able to have a choice in what their children learn in school, mm -hmm. right? Uh, 
we ran, a lot of us, all of us had some sort of messaging around wanting parents to have a say in their kids' education. And we wouldn't be alone in this venture. According to the 2223 Venereal Disease and Sexual Education Audit performed by the Ohio Department of Education and Workforce, there are 58 school districts in Ohio that offer additional sex ed instruction beyond what is required with the abstinence-only training in the Ohio Revised Code. And in each case, parental notification was provided and parents had the choice to opt into that part of the health curriculum. So I'm really hoping to find some common ground here and some agreement over the idea of providing some sort of optional sex ed education um, that we can provide guidance to Kim and Bob and the rest of the team to do some research on these things. And I'll get to my specific asks shortly, but um, I wanted to share some insights from the scientific community regarding sex ed in schools. I, I really thank everybody for their patience on this because I think this is some really important information. I have reviewed dozens of peer-reviewed articles on this topic and pulled 15 or so for the board to review. Um, I'm gonna cite a few of these, and so f I, I created a shared folder that I sent out to you all before the meeting. I also have printed copies of the articles. If you all wanted more context on what these studies were about, I, I have them available for you. Um, but I wanna talk about a few different aspects of Ohio's sex education model and some of the benefits and um, drawbacks of it. Starting with abstinence-only education, which is what's required in Ohio. So there was a, a study in 2007 in the Public Library of Science Medicine Journal, and they noted, it, quote, two recent systemic re or systematic reviews of abstinence-only curricula suggest that uh, the best implemented and evaluated programs fail to delay the initia initiation of sex uh, sexual intercourse or to produce other, uh, <clears throat> other reductions in HIV or risk behaviors. They also found uh, no delays in sexual intercourse among uh, virginity pledger, uh, pledgers. Um, and uh, a U.S. congressional review found that 11 of the 13 most frequently used abstinence-only curricula contained false, misleading, or distorted information, including inaccurate information about contraceptive effectiveness. Um, there was another study also in 2007 from the British Journal of Medicine who was looking at um, the effectiveness of abstinence-only programs in high-income countries, and they used the U.S. as the context for that. Um, finding, quote, evidence from this review suggests that abstinence-only programs that aim to prevent HIV infection are ineffective. Um, and then there was another study that was, you know, I feel really important to this conversation. A 2017 study from the American Journal of Sexuality Education entitled, Worth the Wait, the Consequences of Abstinence-Only Sex Education for Marginalized Students. And these were interviews that were conducted with young women, youth of color, and LGBTQ or other gender non-conforming students. And there were six themes that emerged from the interviews with this population regarding abstinence-only education. One was a lack of practical information that met them where they were in their current stage in their lives. Um, two, abstinence-only education tends to normalize sexist and heterosexist stereotypes, which leads to othering of st uh, students of certain identities. Students of color were all, all often adultified, where assumptions were made on their uh, sexual activity, which resulted in education that also you know, wasn't relevant to them for where they were in their lives. There was, a lack of mo an, um, there was a lack of emotional safety where LGBTQ students did not feel safe asking questions or expressing themselves in, the, in these courses. And there was a reliance on fear and shaming, in addition to some of the information sharing for outside resources, as I had mentioned before. So this is just a sampling of studies among dozens in the scientific community that highlight the limitations of abstinence-only education that talk about how it doesn't lead to delays in sexual intercourse. It doesn't lead to um, decrease, uh, decreases in sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, it's not effective in preventing HIV, and it creates um, uh, a place where marginalized students feel out of place within this form of education. On the other hand, there are multiple models of sexual literacy programs, medically-based sexual literacy programs. Um, one study uh, specifically uh, from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2022 examined 30 years of county-level data on teen births in counties that receive federal funding assi assistance to support these medically accurate sexual literacy programs that include more than just abstinence, include um, <coughs> robust courses on gender identities, um, sex human sexuality, um, contraceptive use. And they, they found, quote, 
Um, results of this quasi-experimental design provide evidence of the causal effect of federal funding for uh, more sexually literate education on teen births. We find that federal funding reduced the overall rate of teen births at the county level by more than 3%. So that was over the course of 30 years, teen birth rates in counties that supported sexual literacy um, had teen births decrease by 3%. Another study in the Archives of Sexual Behavior from 2021 um, found that uh, laws that required um, um, more uh, medically-based sexual literacy programs decreased sexual activity and raised contraceptive use for youth who are sexually active, while state policies that mandate abstinence were uh, found to increase sexual activity and decrease hormonal contraceptive use among youth who are sexually active. Evidence was found that in districts where the districts had local control over the content, such as what we're talking about here, like this supplemental content to what the state provides, um, there was a dec decreased probability that high school youth were having sex in the three months prior to when the uh, survey was taken. Um, whereas requiring abstinence only sex education led to an increase in the likelihood of, of sex in the prior three months to when the survey was taken. Um, let's see, I know, I, I know this is a lot. There was a, a few other studies that I did want to mention. There was a study in 2021 in the Journal of Adolescent Health. It was a meta-analysis, it was a review of literature over 30 years on sex education in, in kindergarten through um, 12th grade. What they found was um, schools that adopted sexual literacy programs can also lower homophobia and homophobic related bullying can increase understanding of gender and gender norms and it can improve knowledge and skills that support healthy relationships, right? And that there was evidence to suggest that sexuality education is most effective when it's begun early before sexual activity ac actually begins. So what we're talking about here are outcomes of reducing the uh, instances of adolescent sex, reducing outcomes that we're all interested in, such as um, STIs, teenage pregnancy, increasing things like contraceptive use, decreasing things like homophobia and homophobic bullying and increasing tolerance. Voices that are often left out of this conversation are student perspectives and what students want to learn when it comes to sex education all the time is the adults making those decisions for kids. So there are another couple of studies I wanna mention regarding these student perspectives from 2020 in the Journal of Adolescence um, this was a review of literature, 16 studies in this topic between 2008 and 2019, which they found that adolescents viewed um, sexual health programs favorably if they utilized knowledgeable, open-minded educators and created a comfortable environment, provided, the, uh, provided content throughout early and late adolescence and delivered relevant uh, educational material. Um, where they were uh, sexual health, they, where they destigmatized de sexual health and improved the relevance of course content delivered. That relevance of course content is really important to this discussion. There's a 2022 article in the academic journal Sex Education um, that examined sex education preferences in a rural Indiana school district. Their data was collected through focus groups and web surveys, so a mixed methods study. And it's a district that teaches abstinence only ed education. And this came straight from the students of those programs that said that the information was not relevant and it, they were being shamed into not having sex, that abstinence isn't relevant to them now or later in their lives because, quote, most people in the schools are already having sex and so they're unable to connect the education that they're learning to their current lifestyles. There was a resistance to abstinence-only education. The students were not listening and not paying attention. And what, so what they wanted was best practices for safe sex and information on what to do if you feel like you have contracted a, a STI. Information on abortion, even though in Indiana and the district it's uh, controversial, um, you know, there's uh, religious objections to it, but recognizing it as needing the information to make a decision that's best for them. And regarding sexuality, it was noted that the LGBTQ students in the district were afraid of being pressured and being ma made, uh, made fun of. Um, there's one more study that I specifically want to mention regarding student perceptions on this. There was a very recent study, just came out in 2024, from the Journal of Adolescent Health, that examined a sample of nearly 1,400 middle and high school students in New York State and asked them what questions they had about sex and sex education to help try to guide um, the content that they would provide in these courses. And the topics included consent, pregnancy, withdrawal or pulling out, 
STIs, condoms, birth control, pain during intercourse, body and hygiene, alternative forms of sexual intercourse, um, and then some other um, individually coded ones that didn't nest into a higher theme. I mentioned earlier that in our district's health curriculum, it says that we're supposed to emphasize that most students aren't sexually active. And I said that that's not true. It, I, I referenced several studies already that talked about it. Um, but there's other research that I provided in here. There's so much research out there that talks about the ages where students become sexually active. Um, I presented some, as I mentioned, but I was able to find a study that r really um, speaks to this. It's a nationwide sample of nearly 6,000 men and women ranging from ages 14 to 94 to examine rates of sexual behavior. So obviously we're interested in the adolescents in the study. So among the adolescent men in the study, 67% were sexually active by the age of 15. And we're talking about a very broad definition of what sexually active means. 9.9% .9 by the age of 15 had engaged in what we would consider traditional intercourse with someone of the opposite sex. That number went up to 30.3% by 17 and 62.5% by 19. So 62.5% of adolescent males by 19 years old had had what we would consider traditional intercourse in a nationwide sample. Among adolescent women, 43.3% were sexually active by 15, again with this broad definition. 12.4% had engaged in traditional intercourse with seven, uh, someone of the opposite sex by the age of 15. That goes up to 31.6% by 17 and 64% by 19. Um, this data even skews even lower. I can show you some research on, on that when we're talking about adolescents from low income families. So now we get to my big ask. It wasn't quite 45 minutes. <laughs> We can't continue to teach abstinence-only education. I think regardless of our personal values and opinion, the data is overwhelming, and many kids are sexually active. Again, broadly speaking, sexually active when they're like natal age and freshman and high school age, and we are doing our kids a disservice. I, I'm being very sincere here. I, I'm not trying to be political or push any kind of agenda. I'm trying to follow data and science for the benefit of our kids while respecting parents' rights to choose what is best for their families. I did speak with Bob Buck and Kim Tinsley, and they expressed that they need guidance from us on how to proceed. And I want to remind the board that we're not responsible for getting into the weeds of the curriculum and like, you know, what books they're reading or what videos they're showing in class. But what they need to know from us is if this is something that we'd like to pursue for our school district, and we would need a majority of people on board to kind of commission them with, hey, hey, let's go out and research and find what some of these options are. So here is my ask plainly. Would the board support Bob and Kim and the rest of the health curriculum team researching some medically accurate sexual literacy programs being used both in Ohio and across the country that we could potentially offer our students as a form of what we'll call abstinence plus sex education, where abstinence is still emphasized as the only way to prevent teen pregnancy and STI contraction, um, but adding additional content related to human development, sexuality, gender identity, and some of these other topics that I mentioned, while again respecting parents' rights to choose to make sure we stay compliant with Ohio Revised Code. So thank you very much for all that. I know that was a ton of information. It's a mouthful controversial topic, but thank you for your time on that. I'd love to hear the board's perspectives. I know way back when, when I was in junior high, we, there was abstinence, and then there was the side effects of not adhering to abstinence, which was STIs and pregnancies and things like that. That was taught to us. I don't really have an issue with that being taught. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're, this is cause and effect type of thing. Um, the rest of your data, I'd have to read it. I mean, mm -hmm. it sounds like you sent us a lot of stuff. Yeah, uh, so all that stuff I cited is in the um, shared folder and in, I have it printed if you prefer that. Mm -hmm. So you can go get more context and, and read up on yourself. There's tons of other studies too. And I, if you have other studies that say opposite, I'd love to read those as well. I have never taken so many notes during a board <laughs> meeting. So thank you for that. Um, I would be interested in pursuing what other options are out there. And I know there are curricula that go to another extreme and I, I don't think this district would be in support of something that nope. was fully comprehensive. I, I get that but I do feel like there is a, a middle ground somewhere and I had called Kim about this too, concern that when I looked at this and have also looked at some of the CDC CD, CD data and I've seen anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of 
um, adolescents by 18 year old being involved in sexual activity and I think are we preparing our kids for the world they live in right now we are educators our job is not to shame our job is not to fear monger our job is to teach um, and to provide accurate information no matter what the topic or conversation is and so I, I do feel like if there are opportunities to make sure that the information our kids are seeking is is accurate and the sources they are finding are valid I think that would be really important I I'm gravely concerned that with the, the limited amount we talk about and the fear mongering we do um, make this irrelevant for kids make it feel like it's not grounded in what they need and then they're going to go to their peers and they're going to go to the internet and that's a scary proposition to me if mm -hmm. that's your next best source of information without really understanding what you're looking for so I would I would support looking for what other options are that would maybe provide a little bit more in-depth knowledge with some of the things like yes abstinence is the only hundred percent mm -hmm. guarantee but um, you know I was looking at some different information today just as I was reviewing the health curriculum over the weekend and one of the things I found recently was because there are other forms of birth control available now they've actually seen a decrease use in condom rates among adolescents not understanding that that is going to be your second best option for preventing an STI right so yes you may be able to prevent pregnancy but that doesn't mean you're keeping yourself safe in other ways and it just feels like we're at a point where maybe our kids don't have the accurate information they need to be making less risky decisions and with two teens sitting in the school district this feels pretty real so yeah. so just to share in seventh grade they talk about how STDs are transmitted Mm -hmm. signs of STDs. They talk about uh, long-term long -term and short-term consequences of STDs. They also talk about relationships, alcohol, and drug use, and, and sexual risks that are accompanied by drinking mm -hmm. or doing drugs. That's in the curriculum mm -hmm. here. Um, they also talk about, let's see, the benefits of being sexually abstinent which I think is a huge benefit especially through high school mm -hmm. um, the more partners you have the worse off you are in relationships down the road so I don't see any problem with that <laughs> continuing to be taught um, they it, it talks about engaging in sexually risky behavior uh, it talks about let's see Uh, it talks about effectiveness or lack of effectiveness of condoms and reducing the risk of pregnancy and STDs. Um, that's all being talked about in seventh and eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Scrolling down to high school. So I do not believe that we need to go into any more depth at such a young age. Um, I, I think this is a conversation that parents need to be having with their children, which is why we had talked in great length about um, giving parents tips and material on how to talk to their children about these things. Mm -hmm. um, because you might be okay with your child having an abortion, but that is something that I have very strong feelings mm -hmm. against, and I would not even be okay with that being discussed in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So. I think that when you're talking about things that are incredibly polarizing, whether it be religiously speaking or politically speaking, those are conversations that I believe are best left to the parents and at home. Mm -hmm. So our job is to educate students and prepare them for, for, uh, for jobs in the future and, and for college or trades or that kind of stuff. I do not believe it is our job to step in as a parent and cover uh, sexual um, identity or sexual behavior or any of these other ish, uh, topics in, in great detail with children because this is such a 
hot topic and an emotional topic, I think this is something that is best left for parents to discuss with their children. And we can give them resources on how to discuss things, but I do not think this is something that needs to be brought into the classroom. But Katie, I, I appreciate what you're saying, and, and I hear you, and I, I feel the same way, and I, I guess I have two responses as a parent. Um, one, I fully support what you're saying, and I think that's why an opt-in would be incredibly important. And I can tell you, too, as a parent, I would opt into this because for the number of times I've tried to talk to my kids that they don't really want to engage in a full conversation about this with their parents is more than one. And so there's, <laughs> the, you know what I mean? So why would we limit options in terms of the, the education we want to give to kids? And again, you would have the option. You, it would be, it was, was it opt-in? Was that the way? Yeah, I mean, it, with the, in the revised code, any additional programming that we would offer is required to be opt-in. Right, so and it so, would still be very much, very much parent choice because yep. you would have to opt in to any more than the Ohio revised code information. So you're asking to pursue what else is out there just so we know what the other curricula look like, what the options yeah. would be? Yeah, and I'm, I'm not saying tonight we're deciding on anything. I, I would envision Kim, correct me, like you would all would be able to provide us with some examples of what some of these additional curriculum could look like, and then we could potentially vote on if there's something we wanted to adopt. And so my ask was, if, if there's not interest from the board, we don't want to waste their time in having them do this research. But if there was a majority of people who are like, I'd like to see what some of these other options are out there, not making a commitment that we're going to adopt any of them at this point, just do we want to see what some options are because there is some compelling data? That's what I'm, I want to know. What about if you had something at the next Parent Academy for Parents? Would that be beneficial? I mean, I think all of it's beneficial. Um, and I think that's something we can have a conversation about. Is like, well, what does it actually look like? Not everything has to happen in the classroom. There can be, I mentioned like this idea of like we could provide additional information rather than just directing them like well you can go talk to your doctor you can talk to these people here's some actual information that you and your parents can consume in the form of articles books podcasts videos um, that can help lead to those discussions in the home uh, Katie you, you did mention there, there are in, in the curriculum there are a lot of these things related to uh, STIs and, and condoms and, and all this type of stuff there are some specific things that I think are missing. Um, and again, I'm not a sex education ex expert, so I don't know where age appropriately this fits in. Um, but the things that I notice being absent, fr absent from our curriculum are um, human development, which, it, which includes specifically sexual orientation and gender identity, especially going back to that piece that shows that that can help lower um, homophobia and homophobic related bullying. Um, increased body positivity, conversations around that. More information about healthy relationships. Um, medically accurate sexual literacy. So, um, you know, what is actually happening in your body? Uh, you know, again, I don't think we want to go down to some far extreme. I know this isn't like a liberal community. I, we, we have concerned parents about a topic like this. Um, but another topic I think is vitally important that we do not have in our curriculum is media literacy. And what I mean by media literacy within this context is, is as it relates to adult content online. It's very easy to find. It's very accessible. We talk about addiction as it relates to drugs and alcohol, tobacco. There's addiction uh, pro problems in our country as it relates to adult content, on content online that can serve to set realistic expectations for what sexual relationships look like, realistic un uh, expectations for what occurs during sex, and um, promotes violence against women, which isn't, this is not definitely something we don't want um, to promote. I actually agreed with you on something. There we go, see? Porn addiction is, is an issue. And you it, said it porn, does, I didn't. Um, <laughs> no. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> it, it could be an addiction, yeah. it could be a problem in relationships going forward, yep. and it mm -hmm. does give you unrealistic uh, ideas of, of relationships yes. in, in the future. So I, sure. I actually agree with you on that. So that, th that's a type of thing, like that media understanding. We're not watching, I'm not suggesting at all watching that stuff in class. What, I'm, not. Yeah, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting <laughs> is, oh, what wow. I'm suggesting is teaching our, our kids what it is 
the expectations it creates around you, the, 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 the dangers of it, the, the, those unrealistic expectations that it creates in your mind that leads to unhealthy relationships. There's no, educate, there's no component of our curriculum, to my knowledge right now, that, that covers that piece. I didn't make up that abstinence plus term, by the way. That's a very widely used term as a, um, in states where there is abstinence only in education. We, again, we're still emphasizing abstinence is the only 100% effective way, but there's these other pieces that we can add to it. What those are, that's up to the committee to, to potentially research for us, then we can review it a little bit more uh, closely to see if it would be something we'd want to adopt. Well, I, I don't wish to see the Teaching and Learning Committee look at anything else. I am fine with the abstinence curriculum as it is. Mm -hmm. Look, similar to what Katie said, I think a lot of this is the parents' role. Mm -hmm. So that's my opinion on it. Would, would you I would absolutely love to see more because I, I hadn't even thought about the adult content literacy piece of it and, and where that plays into what kids are finding when they're looking for the information they're not getting. Um, Sarah and Katie, I, I'm, I'm just asking your opinions on these things. Would, would you agree that not all parents have the same knowledge level or comfort level or skill set to have a, a standardized type of conversation with students, with, with their kids rather? So like, for example, what the conversations you might have with your kids are going to be different with the conversations I might have with my kids. So not everybody is getting the same type of education on what human, I, I don't know everything, and know everything there is to know about it either, and I'm assuming neither do you. Like, mm -hmm. we want to make sure our kids are having safe relationships, healthy relationships, they're educated on this, and they're not going online to look in the choose your own adventure world of Google to find out what, what this is all about. Well, hopefully those parents have controls on their kid's phone or devices not to be able to search that information. Um, no, I stand firm on yeah. what I said. So this, the second question I wanted to ask then, and again, I'm not trying to get in an argument about this stuff, was I, I know parent choice was important to you all when, when you ran. How does that jive with, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this would be, parents could opt into this. We're giving the parents the choice of what they would want their students to learn. And it seems like that, that's what you were saying when you guys ran, is that you were for parent choice in their education. But now you're saying you don't want parents to have that, like, I don't want it. So can you help me understand a little bit more? Sure, what I, yeah. I think we should follow the law and it is your choice as a parent to have that kind of discussion with your child. Mm -hmm. I think you've done a lot of research. It sounds like you're really passionate about this subject and I don't see what's stopping you from having that conversation with your kids. Mm -hmm. And if you want to get together with your friends and talk about it, I mean, that's your prerogative, but no, I'm, I, I think we should keep what we have as an abstinence only because that's, you know, that's where I would stand. Okay. All right, Bob. What do you think? Oh, I, I said you, uh, abstinence and um, like, I, like I learned in junior high, it was the pros and, or not the pros and cons, the causes and effects. You know, abstinence only and then if you choose not to, these are the, the consequences of your actions. I'm not saying a child is a negative consequence, I'm just saying this. Mm -hmm. So are you saying you would not support uh, research into additional options that we could be presented with from the district? I wouldn't go past what we've already, like if what I just said is about as far as I'm willing to go right now. Which is what we have right now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Does anybody else have anything for board discussion? No? Okay. Um, the next meeting, the date did change. So it is May the 22nd and it is here still at Mercer. And can I get a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> Mrs. Stewart? Yes. Mr. Bibb? Yes. Dr. Simmons? Yes. Dr. Strickler? Yes. Mrs. Jonas? Yes. Thank you everyone for coming.